Hello everyone, good evening and thank you so much for joining us for this Microsoft React workshop this evening. Um, well, it's evening for me. Um, I don't know where you are in the world, so it can be good morning or good day. Welcome, anyhow. Uh, my name is Erika and I am the program manager at Microsoft React Stockholm. Today, we are going to start with the championing Azure series and which is aimed um, to provide the necessary skills in Azure and is perfect for those early in their developer career. The series focuses um, on three platforms in Azure, AI and machine learning, cloud native and DevOps. Throughout our hands up workshops, we will introduce the basics of Azure and demonstrate what the platform is capable of. For the next six weeks, on Wednesdays, we have beginner content in Azure's cloud native. But before um, I, we, I continue, I would just like to say a very quick word uh, about Microsoft's code of conduct. Uh, we all come from different backgrounds, but we are all here to learn. So just please be aware of each other, uh, be welcoming and respectful. Thank you. Um, but now let's move on to the real reason we are all here today. And let me introduce our speaker, Chris Klug. Chris is a developer badass as a service that either creates or solves problems, depending on who you ask, as he says. He loves creating and building things, whether it be a new application, a new kitchen table, or a new RC helicopter, you will see him building things all the time. Most of the time, that means writing code or so and solving problems for clients at a company called Active Solutions in Stockholm, though. In his free time, Class, even when Chris is not building something, he goes mountain uh, biking or kiteboarding. So today I am very, very happy, welcome, uh, very happy to welcome him to this first event, an introduction to cloud native options. This session will focus on looking at the different options available in Azure when wanting to run cloud native applications. Each of the options have pros and cons. So knowing what these pros and cons are for the different options, will make it easier to select the right one for your application. This session is going to run for about 40, 45 minutes with questions at the end, with time for questions at the end. Um, but I encourage you to ask your questions throughout the session and Chris will ask, uh, reply them as he goes. Um, and now I think I have spoken enough. So um, let's bring you to the stream, Chris. Where Thank you are, you. there you are, there, cool. yes. Um, so yeah, thank you so much once again for being here today um, in, in your evening. Um, I think, yeah, I've spoken enough. So I, I'll just remove myself from the stream, uh, but I will be here in the background if I'm okay. needed. Okay. Sounds I see good. You soon. Thank you for having me. I'll talk to you later. Yeah. Um, so welcome everyone. Um, yeah, the uh, talk of today is introduction to cloud native options. Uh, and it's obviously a, a talk about Azure stuff uh, and the, the different options we have for running cloud native applications in Azure. So my name is Chris Klug. Uh, I work at a company called Active Solution. Um, and I've been working with software development since 2000, 2001 professionally, um, and been focusing on the Microsoft platform most of that time. Uh, and lately it's been a quite a heavy focus on Azure. And lately, I mean, the last 10 years basically has been Azure focused completely. Um, the company I work for, Active Solution, we uh, do software development. We have senior software developers all over Sweden. So, uh, and, and we work on, on cool, interesting Azure projects. So if you're looking for uh, somewhere to work, please ping us. We need people. Everybody needs people. We need more cool developers. Um, it's also good to say, before I get started, I want to mention there is a, there's a whole track on cloud, cloud native stuff. Um, and what we got here is the list of, of cloud native uh, championing stuff that we are presenting. You're currently going to the first one or listening to the first one, which is the January 19th one, which is the introduction to the different cloud native options. But then there will also be another set of presentations with event-driven architecture by Alan Smith, serverless architecture with Microsoft Azure also. Alan Smith, and then I'll come back and talk about containers and Docker. We've got Azure Container Apps with Jakob Ehn, and we've got Azure Kubernetes Service with Jakob Ehn as well. So there's, there's much more for you to pick up in the future. Uh, this is um, actually a very 
low code, actually no code introduction to what we can use Azure and why Azure is, is a, a good option for uh, cloud native applications. So the question is often, what does cloud native mean? Um, I, I love that question myself because when I wrote it down on the PowerPoint, uh, I started looking at the question and I was like, that's a, that's a very interesting question because it, it brings a lot of sort of preconceived notions. What, what does it mean? And, and most of the time people start yelling, hey, it's Kubernetes. Um, Kubernetes is cloud native. And I do agree. Uh, Kubernetes is, is very cloud native. So when we build for Kubernetes, we do end up building stuff for uh, that, that is cloud native because that's the way that Kubernetes works. But the reason for this talk is actually mostly about me trying to get you away from thinking if we're going to the cloud and being cloud native, it has to be Kubernetes because that is really not the case. So what does it mean? What does cloud native actually mean? Well, there are a couple of tenant sort of pillars that you build on top to, to create cloud native applications. So one of them is that you build either API centric and or event driven systems. So it's a, it's a nicer word of saying basically microservices based architectures, which is very common in the cloud. And, and the reason for this is, well, there, there, there are multiple reasons. It just fits the cloud very well, but also API centric, which is really popular means that we, we build our apps as APIs, which means that we can have multiple clients using our functionality. We can give the API to third parties. We can have partners using the API. We can, we can do a bunch of things with an API to do things. And then clients is something you plug into the API, which is quite nice. And it also makes it possible for us to communicate across different services. And event-driven is another style of programming that's often used with cloud native applications because with cloud native, we were often talking about going internet scale or cloud scale. So we were expecting high load potentially uh, and event driven architecture can, can manage load in a different way because we send messages and messages don't have to be processed straight away. They are asynchronous. So if we get a very heavy load with lots of messages, they will slowly be handled over time when we have time to handle it. So it, it handles that scaling thing in, in a very nice way. Um, and, and also, it means that we get a very loosely coupled situation. So we don't couple services together by having them call HTTP endpoints or, or some other sort of hard form of coupling between them. Instead, we just send out messages and then somebody will pick that, up mes that message up. And we don't really care about who does it as long as somebody handles the message and the message is in the wrong, right format. So those are two very common things to do in, in Cloud Native. We also talk about building resilient and scalable solutions. So two different things, but they actually sort of stick together because in the cloud, we often talk about um, the, the whole idea of scaling um, horizontally, which means that we can add more instances, we load balance things. And by building our applications in a way that works for scalable, it often means that we add and remove instances. So we scale out and we scale in. Uh, which is really cool because we can scale up and, and handle massive loads. And then when we don't need it anymore, we can scale back down again, as long as our architecture is built around the idea of horizontal scaling. But that also brings in the resilient part because in the cloud, we often have to take much more into account that services might not be available. Services might be down because they're be being moved. Uh, they often talk about moving things in the cloud. Oh, they're moving from one cluster, from one node in a cluster to another, it's not actually a move. It's actually, hey, let's spin up a new instance and kill the old one. So, and, th and that can happen due to maintenance in the cloud and all of that. But in the cloud, it just becomes much more obvious that we have to react to resilient or build resilient applications. Whereas in our own data center, we're most of the time actually in full control of when things happen. So we know that, oh, this thing is going to move. Let's do that when we have a, a, a window where there's no usage of the site. So we maybe have maintenance windows and things like that. In the cloud, it's not the way it works. So instead, we have to build applications that are resilient to changes, resilient to things not being there, things being down for the moment. So, so we have to have retry logic and things like that. We often try to come into, or we kind of have to figure out stateless versus stateful. Um, state 
is is good in a lot of applications because if you keep state, it's easier to build things. Stateless applications are a bit harder uh, because we often want to work with data, which means that we need often need some form of state to manage. But with cloud native, we need to think very hard about making things either stateless or stateful. Uh, so we make a service either stateless or stateful, but it's a choice. You don't make do both. So if you want, if you need it to be stateful, then you build it stateful. If you don't need stateful states, you build it stateless. And most of the time, it's actually better to outsource your stateful stuff or your state things to the cloud. So instead of keeping state in your, your service or your application, you put that state into a SQL database or a Cosmos DB database or in storage or somewhere else. And then you have a stateless application that basically reads that state when it needs it. So I got a question here about what resilient tool do you recommend? Well, resiliency from the, the last slide is, is actually more, it's not really a tool, it's something that we need to build in, but there are examples of, for example, Poly. Poly is a library that we can add that adds right retry logic to HTTP requests and, and things like that, which means that if you put Poly into your application, if you do an HTTP request or you try to talk to a database, and it fails, Poly will actually go in and make sure that it catches that those sort of what's called transient errors, something that's down temporarily, and then retries it for you. And you can tell it how you want to retry, how many retries you want to do, if you should have a back, back off policy and things like that. So Poly is probably the most common thing to put in when it comes to building resilient uh, applications for managing services being temporarily offline. So that's that's one suggestion from me. Uh, okay, sorry, that was a sideline going over to, to answering your question. Um, so stateless, stateful, just keep track of, they, they need to be separate, but both are acceptable, but you don't mix them. You make them two separate services. So we're also often talking about cloud native being language agnostic. There isn't a specific language for building cloud native application. It's not like, oh, you're going to go and build a cloud native application. You have to use Go or you have to use C Sharp or you have to use blah. It, it's about using the right tool for the job. And with microservices, um, uh, we, can, we can basically build one service in one language and one service in another language because it we have microservices and they communicate using messages or um, gRPC or HTTP and, so, and the implementation can be whatever you want. Uh, so you can build one service using C Sharp and then you build another one in Python and you build a third one in Go because those different languages make sense for that specific service, uh, which is really cool. So we, we end up potentially having a mix of languages in our application to get the best situation for the team building it, maybe they have better experience in one language, or maybe we're doing something where one language is better at doing that specific thing than another. We're also talking about plat platform agnostic. Once again, um, cloud native doesn't require you to run a specific platform. It's not like, oh, you have to run it on uh, Kubernetes on Linux for it to be cloud native. Um, you can run it on Windows, you can run it on Linux, it's fine. Both of them are, are options in both cases. and. Azure supports both of them. So you, there's a lot of Linux in the cloud native space for different reasons, but there's nothing that says that you have to run Kubernetes on Linux. It's just a matter of, hey, pick what, what you want and that should make sense. Um, this is also an interesting thing with automation. Uh, there is not really a way for you to build cloud native applications without automating things. So. If we end up doing a microservices-like architecture or a service-based architecture where we deploy a bunch of different services, we want to have continuous uh, releases going on, we want to make sure that it scales well, there's a lot of automation going in there. Uh, scaling is partly automated, or rather it is automated and handled by the cloud provider, but it's, it's a form of automation. But we also want to go ahead and make sure that we have CI pipelines to make sure that our tests are being run automated whenever we make a commit so that we, we have confidence in the stuff that we're building. And we want to have 
continuous delivery if possible, uh, or at least a, a relatively short release cycle. So we keep releasing new features continuously. And with automation, that should be a simple thing. You should just press a button and it should release. Um, so with all of this automation, it means that you need to make sure that you have your build pipelines in order and, and have your workflows or Git, GitOps or whatever you want so that everything with the deployment of an application is automated. There should be no manual steps in there. It shouldn't be, oh, John over here has to go and do this thing or Lisa has to go and release that thing. It's, it's a, it should be just automated all of it as much as possible. Um, and then hosting. This is kind of where it comes into more of a, a physical thing or a choice. It's like, how do we want deployed it? Most of the other stuff is architectural. How do we architect our application? And that's different depending on what kind of solution you're building, what team you have, and so on and so on. But when it comes down to hosting, that's a very sort of solid fixed thing. It's like we can select these options and, and we go with it. And it doesn't necessarily need to be Kubernetes, as I've said many, many times. Uh, there is, there's other ways of doing it depending on what cloud provider you have it. They have their own different ways of doing it. Uh, but generally, you look at with cloud native, you, you can deploy containers. So you need to have some form of container environment that can run. And that can be Kubernetes, but it can also be other things. You can also decide and say, hey, I'm going to use POS services or what's called platform as a service. Um, and this allows us to sort of not care about virtual machines and things like that. But the, the cloud provider gives us a platform to host our applications. We give them the application. We focus on building the application and solving the business problems we have. And someone else manages the infrastructure part for us uh, and just gives us a platform to run on. And, and finally, the, the most abstracted thing we've got is function as a service, which is where we build functions uh, which are just single responsible functions that, hey, I do one thing. I do that one thing really well. There's a standardized interface for it. And the hosting company or the cloud provider you're using knows how to run your function. So you basically create a function and say, whenever I get an HTTP request, I want to run this function here. I don't care how the HTTP request comes in. I don't care anything else. Just run this for me. Or when there's a message on a queue, here is a function that should run. I don't care how you talk to the service bus or the message or the queue or anything like that. Just once that message comes in, run this little function for me. That's very abstract. We have no idea what's running that under the hood. Uh, and the cloud provider just solves that for you. So there is th that becomes much more of a sort of a decision to make. Where do we want to go with this? But it's not just Kubernetes. So the question is then, what, what does Azure have that, that gives us these abilities? What can we do with Azure? And why is Azure a good choice when it comes to building cloud native applications? besides the fact that it is a cloud. Um, that's a, a, a given. So they have cloud infrastructure. They have cloud support. They, they are a cloud. Uh, but what else can they help us with? And so for the, uh, the whole API-centric and or event-driven, uh, once again, that's an architectural thing. It's something that you actually have to implement. You have to go and say, hey, I want to build an API-centric application. I want to build a microservices architecture, or I want to use events and an and event-driven architecture as such. Um, and the thing is, that's good. You have to make the decision. But Azure can still help, right? So when if you decide that you want to build an API-centric solution, you want to expose an API, and you want to build some microservices and unify them as an API and offer it up for a way for somebody to use your API, then they have something called Application Gateway, which can allow you to put a reverse proxy in front of it and basically combine multiple services into one API. Uh, you've got API management where you can put actual API management in front of it where you can package up things and say, this is an, a specific API that we want to give it, that you can give to, to your third parties to use. And you can say there's request throttling and there are limitations and it can handle its security and a bunch of other things. So there's stuff in Azure that can help you with the API parts of it. And if you do decide to go and build event-driven stuff, then sure, if you start Googling it, people are going to talk about end service bus and, and Kafka and a bunch of different things. But the thing is, Azure has a, a service bus, 
which any service bus can can use, for example. Um, and the service bus will do your messaging for you. You don't have to care about building your own messaging infrastructure. It's just there. You just go and sign up for the service bus. Or if you want to do events based on other things in Azure, so basically, oh, whenever somebody puts a file into blob storage or whenever this thing happens over here in your infrastructure, you can use something called Azure Event Grid and say, hey, I want to listen to events that are happening in my infrastructure or in my cloud environment and then react to things in my cloud environment. So that's also quite useful. So Azure does help you with both the API-centric stuff and the event-driven stuff with services that they offer on top or beside your application that you're building. When it comes to resiliency and scalability, um, so Azure will always build their own services in Azure to be as resilient and as scalable as possible, um, which then actually is, is quite interesting because they scale immensely, but they will also make sure that their services uh, are, are secured. So if you start hammering their services with tons of requests to a point where they can't handle it, they will actually start throttling you. And that's where you come into the resilient stuff where their services will be resilient and load balanced and, and all of that. But you will still have to make sure that there's that you are handling your application and making that resilient to failures. So if your application can't reach the database because it's down or it can't reach the talk to the database because the Azure is currently throttling your request because the server is overloaded and things like that. But in the end, Azure services will be as resilient as possible. Uh, they will scale. You can Most services, you can have a little slider where you just go, I want a bigger one. I want more. I want more. You just pay for more and they will give you more. Uh, and when it comes to your own applications that you are building, then you will have to take care of the resiliency, but the scalability, as long as you build your application in a way that is scalable and, and that generally means stateless, then you can just deploy your stateless service and then tell Azure that I want to run 400,000 instances of this, might be a bit excessive, but 10 or 20 instances, and Azure will just scale it out for you automatically. Um, and here is an important thing when you build cloud native things, you want to aim for horizontally scalable. So basically, you want more instances, not bigger instances. So when you want to scale your application and make it handle more load, for example, you want to do that by adding another instance of that service. So I have two. Now I can handle double the load. I need more. I do three. And now I can add another 50% load on top of it. If you start doing and saying, no, I need to scale what's called scaling vertically and making it bigger and scale up, then it means that when you need more load, you need to get a bigger machine. And at some point, you're going to end up at the point where the machine is going to be the biggest machine available and it's still not enough and you're stuck because you have only one machine. And that is why building scalable things that can scale horizontally and add more instances is much, it's much better because there's almost no limit on how much you can scale. And once again, with Azure, you just pull a slider and there are more instances available for you. The statelessness and statefulness, well, once again, that's an architectural decision for you to manage. You make sure that your services are either one or the other. Um, but for Azure, they will have things to for your stateful stuff. So if you want to build stateless, but you need to store state somewhere so you can work with it, then Azure has those services for you as well. So they've got Azure SQL databases where you can talk SQL to it. You've got Cosmos DB, which is a document store, store where you can store your no, no, uh, no SQL stuff. And uh, they've got a Redis cache where you can store things in a cache very, very quickly. Um, so all of those things are available. And when you start looking at building cloud native, you probably want to see if it's not possible to build pretty much all of your services stateless uh, for performance reasons and scalability reasons and so on. And then outsource all of your stateful stuff to Azure. Let Azure handle all of that state stuff. Under the hood, they are doing a ton of really cool things to make sure that your stateful things are load balanced and managed and all of that, um, just so, so it just works for you. Uh, whereas if you need to do it yourself, it's actually quite complicated. Um, 
So here's a complicated question before I go on to the next, I'm just gonna stay here. Uh, please discuss horizontal scaling for stateful services. So horizontal scaling for stateful services is really, really complicated um, because once you start adding a state to a service and you wanna scale it horizontally, you are kind of screwed, uh, pardon my French, uh, because you can't just add more instances because each instance is going to have its own state. So then you end up having to make some way of making sure that either that all requests are are sticky and they all every user always ends up at the same service, which is bad from a performance point of view and causes problems when you move things around, or you need to invalidate states. Uh, and then that means that whenever you make a change to your state, you have to tell all the other instances that they have to make the same state change in all of it. And that's just very, very complicated, which is why horizontal scaling of stateful applications is a massively complicated problem in my mind. Uh, if, you, if you need to do stateful applications, um, then you, you probably want to look at some way of, of having your state handled in sort of a cluster-like scenario. Um, you might want to look at something like uh, Akka.net, which allows you to do stateful things uh, in a cluster. Uh, but it's a whole different story, and it just adds a lot of complexity. So horizontal scaling and stateful services, I'm just going to say that the short version, really, really complicated. Try to avoid it. Uh, if you have to do it, see if you can find some other framework that will help you with it, because the problem is that state is going to kill you when you start scaling horizontally because you need to have all of this. I've changed my state. Now you need to change your state and so on. Um, I think there was another question as well. No, that was probably it. Uh, well, there's security. Um, so security is, a, is a, a whole topic on its own. So the question was, any thoughts on security for Azure third-party services? Um, if you have services, are you looking for services? So. If you want to offer, offer up your services or your API to third parties, then you, there's a bunch of ways for you to have tokens, uh, authentication and authentication and things like that. Azure will do a, a certain amount of uh, DDoS security and you can add extra stuff on top of that. Uh, if you're doing a web application, uh, there's a web application firewall that you can put in front of it that will actually take care of things like SQL injection attacks and, and a bunch of other things. So there's there's a lot of security things in Azure. Um, some of them are, are feature-based like firewalls, and some of them are the fact that you can actually go and put your services on a private network and actually secure it completely from the outside and things like that. So there's a, there's a whole story around security that you will have to have a look at uh, depending on what applications you're building. I'm going to carry on a little bit more because there's a Quite a few slides. I'll, I'll get back to the questions as, as they I go along. Uh, so language agnostic. Um, well, that's kind of interesting because we do do a bunch of different languages. And Azure is language agnostic to a certain degree. So most of the services that have native code running in them, like uh, web apps and, and, and functions and things like that, support .NET, Java, Node, Python, and a, a couple of other languages as well natively. So that's just a matter of you, it, it, you choose what you want. And if you do choose a language that is not supported natively by the service in Azure, you can generally get around it by using um, containers instead. So you use Docker containers, you put up your, your Docker images, you run your containers, and inside your container, you can do whatever you want. And there's a lot of different container support in Azure for both Windows and service-based containers. Platform agnostic, um, well, we are talking Azure. Uh, so we are talking Microsoft, but Azure, Microsoft is now very much pro Linux as well. They even have their own Linux distro and they're involved in the Linux kernel and things like that. So in Azure, you can choose both Linux and Windows, all services, I think, more or less support both of them. There are the SDKs for langu different languages for everything. Uh, so it's, it's you can choose whatever platform you want. If you want to go Linux or Windows, there's support for it. Linux is often cheaper as well because you don't have the licensing cost of Windows on top of it. Uh, and to be personally, per perfectly honest, me personally, I'm a Microsoft person. I've been doing Microsoft development for eons. Uh, but for the last several years, uh, I've actually owned more or less 
only deployed to Linux based machines because I write .NET Core code and .NET Core supports Linux. Linux is cheaper. So I use Linux for most of my stuff. I even use Linux locally uh, with WSL for my development now because there are some benefits in, in the stuff that I'm working with that just works well with, with Linux. Uh, automation, well, uh, there will be no direct automation in, in Azure that will just solve that for you. Once again, it's something you have to build, but Azure is built on API-centric stuff. So there's an API for everything. So whatever tool you use for your automation will work fine. Uh, you can deploy to Azure from basically anything, including command line. Uh, and if you uh, want to stay within Azure and stay really close to Microsoft, you've got Azure DevOps, which is an, an Azure-based service that does your builds for you and your pipelines and all of that. Uh, so all of your automation needs can be done more or less in DevOps, or you can go and use GitHub, which is now Microsoft, a Microsoft owned product. Uh, GitHub has fantastic Azure interop as well. And if you decide to build your things using Team City or deploy it using Octopus Deploy or any other thing, most of the different deployment tools out there will have support for deploying stuff to Azure because it is uh, basically, it's, it's an API. Anyone can deploy to it. And hosting, this is kind of where it starts getting really interesting because we are talking about Azure, Azure is hosting. So what options do we have for cloud native options in Azure? Well, let's have a look. So first of all, the natural suggestion that I will hear for cloud native applications is AKS. Um, AKS is, is cool, uh, Azure Kubernetes service. Um, I'll, I'll dive a bit more into them in, in just a second. Um, the other option you have is using what's called Azure App Service, uh, which is a less complex thing than, than Kubernetes for hosting your applications. Um, you've got Azure Functions, uh, which is that function as a service that I was talking about. And finally, uh, you've got Container Apps. Uh, Container Apps is, is the new kid on the block. Um, I, I went through this, um, this slide with, with a friend of mine, uh, and he said, um, so you're not going to mention VMs in here. Uh, and we talked a little bit about it. And we both agreed on, no, v sure, you can spin up VMs and you can host your applications on VMs without a problem in Azure. But it's not very cloud native. You, you really don't want to spin up your own VMs and set up all the networking and manage everything that's needed for building a Microsoft microservices architecture on your own. Uh, that's not very cloud. Cloud is about somebody else doing the work for you, having the infrastructure, all of that, let them manage it. So once you start looking at, oh, we need to spin up our own VMs, take a really, really close look at your application and say, do we really need to spin up our own VM or can we create a Docker image and run it somewhere else instead of doing our own VMs? So Azure Kubernetes Service, or AKS, as it's also called, is a, um, well, it's a semi-managed or partially managed Kubernetes as a service. Uh, so you get a cluster, you, you create an, an AKS cluster, which is a cluster of machines. And Kubernetes is built on two things. There's a control plane, which is the service you talk to to manage everything that's running in your, your service or in your cluster. Uh, and then there are the worker nodes. So when you create AKS, the control plane is managed by Azure. It's a service that they provide. Uh, and there's not much you have to do with that. But you will then get VMs uh, that are part and configured for running as a uh, Kubernetes cluster. Those VMs are up to you to manage. So they have to be rebooted every once in a while. You have to upgrade the versions on it. So there's a bit of manual management on the actual worker nodes in your AKS cluster, um, which makes it a bit complicated to, to use and run, to be perfectly honest. Uh, and other than that, it, it's a good, great way to get started with Kubernetes, absolutely. But, but for a production scenario, just remember that there is a bit of manual maintenance of the nodes involved as well. Um, having that said, it's Kubernetes. It's, it's awesome in, in a lot of ways and, and has a bunch of really cool features, but it still has some manual things that, to keep in mind. And pricing for uh, AKS is you pay for the VMs, so you pay for the worker nodes, and the cost there is the cost of a VM. So you will have at least two, 
probably three VMs running continuously in your cluster, you will pay for those and the control plane is free. Or you can pay uh, a little cost um, per hour for the control plane and that will give you an SLA for your uh, the control plane as well to make sure that it's always up and running for you. So it, it's, it's really cool, really flexible, uh, but if you're new to it, um, Take some time to learn Kubernetes well because there is there's it, it's a slightly complicated environment. And then you have Azure App Service. So Azure App Service is a bit different. Um, so Azure App Service uh, is a way for you to abstract away the hosting thing uh, more or less completely. Uh, and what Azure does is you you create an app service plan, which is basically a VM under the hood, to be perfectly honest. But you create an app service plan, which you can scale up and down, so you can have more or less. And so it's a slight, small web server cluster uh, or web farm. And then inside that web farm, you deploy your applications. And you generally, if you do .NET Core applications, you just deploy your .NET Core application. That's it. And if you're running on Windows, it will go ahead and spin up an IS, IS for you and put a web server in there and it will host your application for you. And if you're deploying to Linux, it will start a container that has everything that ne that's needed to run your application. And if you're running Node, they will figure out how to do it for Node for you. And if you're running, so all of these different frameworks are available. And if you decide to go with one of them that's supported, you can just upload your application Azure makes sure to, sure to run your application for you. You don't have to care. You just tell it how many instances you want, and it handles it for you. And the idea here is that, as I said, you, you create what's called an app service plan, uh, and you scale that plan up and down. And on that plan, uh, you have your applications running. Uh, and you pay for the plan, basically. And on the plan, you can have multiple applications running. So it, it's like saying, hey, I want to have a as I said, a web server farm, how many servers do you want to have? This many, here is my application. Just make sure that the server farm is running and that my application is on that on the machines. I don't care how you do it, just sort it out. And then on top of that, besides the, the actual hosting of your app, it, it introduces things like, as I said, scaling, uh, both automatic and manual. Uh, it has some configuration set up for you. It does SSL termination. It does SSL certificates for you, custom domain names. It can help you with authentication. They have a bunch of extras added on top of it so your web applications can get services for free, basically just being an app service. An app service as such, the, the, the actual service is actually split into two parts. They are the same thing, but the documentation has them as two separate ones. So it's web app and web app for containers. So a web app is your application running in a server farm uh, on, in, in an app service plan, and that's just it. Web app for containers is kind of the same thing, but instead of giving them your application and saying, here is my .NET Core web app, please run that for me, it's a, you say, here is my Docker image, please run that for me, and it spins up your, it creates containers from your images and puts those in your web server farm instead of having your code running natively on the machine. The only thing you need to do for a web app for containers is create an, an image with, that exposes port 80 and or 443 to handle HTTP requests. And other than that, uh, Microsoft or Azure doesn't care at all. You just give them an image, they will run it for you. And, and then you have the scaling and authentication and all of that automatically as well. Um, Azure Functions, as I said, that's a, another sort of simplification or abstraction of everything. Uh, in, in Azure Functions, you just write the code for a function, which is literally a function. It's a, whatever language you're in, but I'm a C-sharp person, so it's a C-sharp function. You put some attributes on it to tell it that it's a function, uh, and you tell it that, hey, I want to listen for files being created in blob storage, or I want to listen for messages on a, on a queue, or I want to have a listen for HTTP requests for this address. Uh, and then you give Azure that. You basically say, here is my function. And then you don't do anything else. You have just written the function. You don't care about how it's hosted. You don't care about anything else. And then Azure basically calls your function whenever that trigger that you have defined uh, happens. So it can be, as I said, HTTP requests or something happening in storage or something like that. Um, and the cool thing with functions is that they have two different ways of being pay you're paying for it. 
So you can either go and create a, an app service plan, um, just as with, uh, with the web apps, and then you put your Azure functions inside of that as a function app, or you use what's called a consumption plan. And in that case, you don't have any hardware at all. You don't pay for anything. So in the app service plan situation, you actually pay for that service plan for every hour. Whereas the consumption plan, you don't pay at all. You only pay for when your function is running. So whenever your function runs, they track how many CPU cycles you're using uh, and you pay for that. That's it. So it's, it can be a much cheaper solution uh, because you only pay for what you use. So it's, it's truly platform uh, cloud based so, so to say so it's you pay for what you use nothing else um we've also got container apps um container apps is, is the newest kid on the block it, it's a way for you to give azure an a docker image uh, and then tell azure to run that uh, that's all and you say well chris that's like uh, web apps for containers well kind of except for the fact that it doesn't have to be a web app. It doesn't have to respond to port 80 or 443 uh, over HTTP. Uh, it can be anything. Whatever you put into your image is fine. Uh, and it, it under the hood, what happens when you create an Azure container app is that Azure actually creates a tiny Kubernetes cluster, and it puts your container app, your image, inside of a pod inside of Kubernetes. And then it basically runs a tiny cluster for you, and you can scale it and, uh, and things like that for you as well. Um, but you don't have to care about it being a Kubernetes cluster. You have another layer on top of it. You just say, run this for me and scale it based on these things. And then behind the scenes, Microsoft will manage the whole Kubernetes cluster with Keda and a bunch of things to make it work without you having to care about the infrastructure as such, which is really, really nice. Billing for container apps is a little bit more complicated. So billing for, for a container app is actually based on how much CPU you're using, how much memory you're using, and the number of requests that you're getting for that container app or whatever you're listening for, messages or things like that, so requests coming into it, uh, which makes it a little bit harder to estimate the cost of it. Uh, but it's a really cool way of hosting things that aren't web apps and you don't want to spin up a full Kubernetes cluster just to host that little thing. In this case, you let Azure do most of the work and you just do your container. So I, I decided that I wanted to uh, put it onto a little scale here to sort of explain the differences. And I think there are two things to, to take into consideration when you decide what kind of hosting you want to use. Um, it's vendor lock-in, basically, how easy is it for you to leave your cloud provider? Having that said, once you start trying to have sort of like little vendor lock-in and, and be able to move around between different clouds and things like that, you're also not using the capabilities of your cloud properly because you cannot take any dependencies, which makes it less than optimal for your cloud. It's, it's, it's just the way it is. Uh, and the other thing is how complex is it to work with? How much do you have to do? And, I, I put AKS as very low vendor lock-in and very high complexity because you can move anything that runs in the Kubernetes environment to any other Kubernetes environment in the world and it will basically work. But it's also very complex to work with because you have to manage it, you have to know how Kubernetes works and so on for it to work. Container apps, little less complexity because Azure handles it for you a little bit more vendor lock-in because you don't learn Kubernetes. You just use container apps, which is Azure specific, but under the hood, it's still a container. So you can still, still move that somewhere else or run it locally on your machine or wherever you want to run it. App service, you're now getting slightly more into Azure because it's an Azure based function. It's slightly less complexity, uh, but it's also not completely locked into Azure as such because you can always run that locally on your machine or any other cloud provider or wherever you want to go. But the thing is, it's it's more managed by Azure, which means that it's less complicated to work with. And finally, if you go Azure Functions, then you're all into Azure. You cannot take a function and run it anywhere else more than locally on your, you can run it locally on your machine and there, 
are other ways to run them as well, but mainly you're, you're in Azure. On the other hand, it's very, very fast to build. It's very low complexity. You don't have to care about things um, and it just works. And that's kind of the thing with these things that if you accept that you have chosen Azure as your cloud, which is a very good and really good working cloud, once you've made that decision, the more you lean on that cloud and the more you use that cloud, the easier your life is going to be. But it's also going to put you in a situation where it's harder to move somewhere else if you wanted to do that. So it's a, it's a trade-off. And my personal opinion, I, I if you choose a cloud like Azure, like we have done in our company and I've done for ages now, uh, use the service. Use it to its full extent. I'm not going to move my applications anywhere else uh, and spending a bunch of energy and time and complexity to have that option is generally not required. On the other hand, if you lean into your cloud and you actually look at what Azure is offering and you use that, it becomes so much more fun because there's so many really complicated uh, complicated services out there that's just there. I don't have to care about doing SQL Server load balanced and clustered and things like that. I don't have to set up a, a, a very complicated uh, MongoDB situation or anything like that. Anything that I need is available in Azure. I just point and click and say, I want one of these and they will do the scaling for me. They will do the load balancing for me. Um, and, and that's kind of the, the cloud native way. It's built for the cloud, use the cloud uh, and make sure that your application sort of fits in the parameters of the cloud of being resilient and scalable and up for horizontal scaling and stateless. As long as you follow that along, then your application will be cloud uh, cloud native, in my opinion. Um, that's kind of what I want to get into. Uh, I want to thank you all for listening. Uh, I'm, I'm at 40, 44 minutes-ish. Uh, I have some questions here. It says Dapper is something cloud native people should keep an eye on. Official apps, sure, apps. Yeah. So Dapper is a way for you to manage uh, your, your services in Azure. I haven't personally played around with Dapper. Uh, but it's definitely something that you want to have a look at uh, where it helps you with your situation with uh, cloud native applications. Uh, and there are lots of different initiatives of trying to make that work. Uh, Dapper is a really good one. And Azure has bought, uh, Microsoft has, has bought really heavy in, into that and, and has really good support for it. Are there any other questions? Uh, while I wait for questions, um, I can mention that if you are in Sweden um, and you, you feel like having some swag from, from us, uh, some stickers and some cool stuff, go and go to this address here, activesolution.se slash stickers, and just sign up and we'll send over some, some cool stickers for you to sticker bomb your, your laptop. Everybody needs stickers. That's just the way it is. We all know that. Um, and for uh, the rest of the thing, I mentioned that there are more sessions coming up around championing cloud native. Um, I suggest having a look at them all. Um, this introduction was was not very codish. I know. I just it was more a talk about don't think only Kubernetes when doing cloud native, uh, which is what we started talking about when we talked about doing a track around cloud native. Um, and then the rest of them will be much more hands on, much more down to this is what you want to do and this is how you build it. But there's also an AI and machine learning track uh, that you can go and if you're, if you're interested in, in uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, then there's more stuff coming up there with Peter and Alan uh, and Robert from my company as well that you can have a look at. So let's see if we, there's another question here. How does Azure Functions different from Oracle Functions in OCI? Um, that's a fantastic question because I have no idea uh, about Oracle things at all. Um, I assume that it's it, they're probably similar. Um, I, I guess it's it's function as a service. Uh, it's just that for Azure, it's called Azure Functions. Uh, but functions as a service is not Azure specific. There are other implementations of it. Uh, and I assume that the thing that you're looking at from Oracle uh, is is probably the same thing. It's just that with functions as a service, they depend heavily on the underlying architecture and the underlying infrastructure and the cloud as such. So the implementation from Oracle will be different than the implementation in Azure. 
so your code is going to have to look a little bit different. But I do believe that the actual functionality is just functions as a service, which is the same thing. Any other questions? Hey, I'm here. Um, yeah, don't be shy, guys. Ask them now, now or never, or in two weeks. Whenever you're up again. Yeah. <laughs> now or never or in two weeks. Yeah, you can ask them later on. You've also got my Twitter account. Uh, so if you want to have a look, uh, have any questions after this, or you want to ask something, then ping me on Twitter uh, and I'll do my best to sort of try and answer whatever questions you have around this area as well. So you Great. don't necessarily have to wait two weeks. Let's hope that. <laughs> Um, yes. Um, Still better to ask it now. Um, that people are shy or you've just been really, really clear. clear. Um, you know, either way. Um, but yeah, I just want to say um, thank you. A huge thank you, Chris, for this for this introduction um, event today. Yeah, next thank you week. For, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, it was really cool. Um, I will be back, but it's going to be a couple of weeks. Yeah, next week we have Alan, and then um, he is doing event-driven, uh, event-driven every. Or oh, I can't talk; it's too late. Architecture. Um, um, so yeah, that's next Wednesday, or yeah, I, I call it uh, Cloud Native Wednesdays. And tomorrow we have DevOps Thursdays. Mm. Um, so if you guys have not um, seen that yet, um, let me just put my. It's actually my slide here. Mm. No, it's not there. Mm, sorry, never mind. Um, <laughs> it's too much trouble now to getting that up here. Um, so yeah, tomorrow we have, we have introduction to DevOps um, on Meetup. You can find all the events. Um, yeah, I don't have any anything more to say, and I don't think. Um, yeah, there is there is no questions. Just a few people saying thank you. Um, and uh, yeah, somebody says thank. Wow, it was wow. It was wow. Um, so yeah, um, let's wrap it up. I think. Um, yep. No shyness. He presented it well. Thank you for confirming that. Thank you, Nana. <laughs> thank you, guys. It's 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 good to hear that it wasn't a complete waste of your time, at least, because that's always the main concern that you get what you need and the information that you want. And if you got it all, then I'm just very happy. Yes, indeed. And I, I, I also thought it was really, really good. Um, Thank you. But yeah, let's wrap this up. Let's um, let you enjoy your evening, Chris. And you guys, I see you next Wednesday. Have a fantastic rest of the day. Uh, oh, there was one more comment. What was that? Excited for upcoming session. So am I. They are going to be really, really good. The next six weeks, just block your calendar. <laughs> So yeah, thank you. Bye.